Greetings and salutations, friends. It is time to defend Starship Troopers again. The movie that has become the ultimate benchmark for media literacy that no one seemingly is capable of actually clearing. As the Terran Federation is not a fascist state by any stretch of the imagination, in fact it is the exact opposite of a fascist state in nearly every way. It is an extremely libertarian state that rests near exclusively on personal responsibility and a minimalistic government. A point that seems to fly so far over the heads of actually everyone to the point that it must be in stable Earth orbit by now. And today's example of this is Cinema Wins, which marks itself as cinema since, but the exact opposite. And in terms of general style and presentation, that does appear to be the case, focusing in more on the positive aspect of movies rather than the negative ones, and that is absolutely a laudable goal. But as far as Starship Trippers is concerned, he's got it completely wrong. And since I've already done the video years and years ago defending the Starship Troopers against Cinema Sins, this kind of seems kind of perfect, doesn't it? So, let's get into it. I'm doing my part too! Okay, full disclosure, I saw this around 14, 15 years old, and I had no idea this was a satire about a fascist society, so weirdly funny moments like this really threw me and I just thought, ha! Cute, not oh, that's dark. Starting with a minor quibble. So this is obviously Paul Verhoeven referencing the Hitler Youth, one of the more famous and nasty aspects of the Nazi Reich. Incidentally, the creator of the movie has no actual conceptualization of Nazism or fascism and he uses the two words interchangeably, but details, <laughs> that just makes him 98% of the general populace, so we shan't harp on that too much, but the Terran Federation has no equivalent to a Hitler Youth. In fact, you cannot sign up for federal service until you are of age. You are forbidden to do so. This is one of relatively few absolute and strict laws within the Terran Federation. Yet at the same time, when you are of age, there is absolutely nothing the Terran Federation can do to stop you from signing up, unless the psychiatrist literally determines that you are incapable of understanding the oath you are about to give. Incidentally, I will be combining both the books and the movies here as as the reviewer does mention having read the book, which I kind of doubt, but we are going to work off both of them here. Nice little foreshadowing. I mean, it, it already happened, but we haven't seen it yet. Is that foreshadowing? That's like backshadowing. Also, credit where credit is due, Cinema Wins actually gets this part, which Cinema Sins actually failed. This is indeed foreshadowing. These events are happening earlier in the movie, but later in the actual storyline. You'd be surprised how many people actually don't pick up on this. Oh, Ender style being the goal, just without any of that pesky remorse. Credit that is, however, swiftly wiped out by this comparison, which isn't so much apples to oranges as it's donkeys to spaceships, as the example given here of the Formic from Ender's Game is either willfully ignorant or malicious in the case of Starship Troopers. See, the Formic attack humanity because they don't understand that humanity is a living species. They presume us to be fauna. They think we're ants, in essence, the way we view ants. Because the Formic are a collective psychic species with a collective hive mind. Thus, their definition of life is obviously something that resembles them, a collectivist hive species. This would be the equivalent for humanity. If we encountered a species of living rocks, for example, we would not immediately identify them as living creatures because to us, rocks are not living beings. And obviously we've built all kinds of cute stuff and the Formics would have seen this in case of our cities and spaceships etc, but they might easily simply have gone, oh well, ants, much like we look at ants and their incredible structures. Later on in the story, the Formic actually figure out that we are living beings, but by that point, we are already both sides embroiled in an unending war where both sides think that the other is about to eradicate it. In Ender's Game, therefore, the war is an unfortunate accident caused by a galactic misunderstanding. In 
Starship Troopers, there is no misunderstanding. The arachnids know we're intelligent. They literally suck our brains out. They are not trying to eradicate humanity for some accident. They are an aggressive expansionist species that views humanity as getting in the way of their manifest destiny. There appears to be no indication that any sort of diplomatic interaction with the bugs is even possible, as they were the ones that initiated hostilities, choosing actively and knowingly to try and eradicate humanity. And we'll get back to the point about remorse later on. But when you start to pay attention, you can hear Ratchek literally say that their society was started via a military coup and ended democracy. It's not subtle. Ah, Ratchek. This is where well, there's going to be a lot of things wrong. Beginning with this, of course. The veterans did not seize power through a military coup. In fact, if you listen to what Ratchek is saying, you will hear that the democracies of the world had already failed. Government had already collapsed. The world was covered in general anarchy after the enormous wars that had happened earlier where the West lost to the East. There could not have been any military coup by definition because there was no government to launch the coup against. Instead, the veterans began to create various veteran enclaves offering safety and security to people, and these eventually grew into full-blown governments. This is also why I said that I kind of doubt the guy read the book, because this is mentioned in the book. When you vote, you are exercising political authority. You're using force. Force, my friends, is violence. The supreme authority from which all other authority is derived. Fascist says what? That one should be harder to miss, but I also didn't have a working definition of fascism at 13. And neither, my friend, am I sorry to say, do you have one today. What Ratchek just said there is absolute, unquestionable truth. All authority stems from force, from violence. To give you a very simple example of this, you can imbue yourself with all the legal power you want. You can write page upon page upon page, millions of miles of paper and books, giving you the absolute moral justification to do something. But if you go up to a person and say, hey, I have given myself all of these authorities to tell you what to do, and that person tells you to go pound the dirt, you are still not going to have any way to make that person do what you want him to do unless you pick up a stick and say, or else. This is the fundament of our entire system. The police force uses authority in that they are capable of wielding force. Our legal system is underpinned by the implicit threat of force. If you break a law, force will be used against you to make you abide by the law and suffer the consequences for breaking it. Again, no amount of authority, no matter where you claim to derive it from, is worth a single itty bitty thing, unless you can back it up with consequences. Figuring things out for yourself is the only freedom anyone really has. Use that freedom. Make up your own mind. Rico. I mean, that's like genuinely solid advice. Even a fascist cog is right twice a day or whatever. And we're sticking with Ratchek for a little while longer as he gives some great advice. And Cinema Wins admits that it's great advice. This also should be the moment where the whole, is this truly fascism, begins to tickle away at the little mind a bit here, and yet it does not. Instead, he simply goes, well, that's a weird thing for a fascist to say, that you have freedom to make your own choices, despite this, of course, being the underpinning of the entire Terran Federation. So. How do we even explain this? How do we explain the idea that so many people look at this movie and think it's fascist, despite Ratchek having, up until this point, not said anything that can be in any way construed as actually fascistic? Well, I think I have an explanation for this, so let me get it out of the way relatively early on. The primary problem here is that to far too many modern day minds, there is no concept of justifiable action. They all live in a hazy, indistinct realm of pure black and white, where the moral or value of a thing or an action is already pre-described to them. They have no need to figure out these values or morals for themselves because they live in the comfortable cocoon of modern-day democracy and society. Thus, a statement as obviously and self-evidently true as violence is the supreme authority comes across as bad. Why? Because it's told to them by somebody who's a fascist. And why is he a fascist? Well, because the Federation wears fancy uniforms. 
Literally, that appears to be the sole reason why anyone calls this fascist. The imagery of it. And fascism, of course, is bad. Even despite the fact that, again, the person in question has no conceptualization of what fascism is, or any idea what the ideas of fascism are. All he knows is that fascism is bad, and thus he is confused when the not-at-all fascist teacher that has become a fascist teacher simply by being placed in a movie where he is on the well-dressed side says something that does not dry with his generalistic idea of fascism. And yet, meanwhile, the relentlessly aggressive communal bugs that have no goal in mind but the eradication of human life are viewed as sympathetic? Something that we should have remorse for killing? <laughs> Why? Well, because they are the other, they are the non-fascist, as we have already defined the fascist in the room. And since they are also, the bugs that is, the out-group which the modern mind has grown to fetishize to a ludicrous degree, in large part due to the vilification of nationalism because it is connected to fascism in the same way that fancy clothes are. Thus, we end up in a situation where the person watching this has already determined what fascism is, fancy clothing, and thus forces that definition upon anything that has fancy clothing because they don't actually understand anything else about fascism. If your definition of fascism is literally good uniforms and militarism, then yes, by that definition, the Federation is fascist. So long as you don't bring any politics into it. Fun and not at all dystopian cameo for screenwriter Ed Newmeyer. Also, according to Twitter Big Brains, not at all a sign of a fascist society that he was arrested, convicted, and sentenced in less than 24 hours. Oh, and I suppose speedy justice, also fascism. <laughs> now, Admittedly, this could absolutely be a sign of an authoritarian regime, no doubt about it. Having somebody be arrested and then executed within 24 hours could absolutely be abused, duh. But it could also be a sign simply of a speedy justice system. If somebody is seen shooting someone on the street, everybody saw it, there's tons of witnesses, there is video evidence, yada 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 yada, then do we really require a six month long trial eating up unfathomable quantities of public resources? Probably not. And of course there are obvious problems with this sort of a justice system, duh, but this also is not fascistic. You take a stroll down Wash out lane! You can just quit? Huh, expectation subversion. I have to assume when you completely militarize your society you don't need conscription and might as well only keep the people who can really fash it, I mean hack it. And another point of you really should be noticing by now that this isn't fascism. Yes, that is right. At any point you can choose to leave Federation service, whenever the hell you want. You can simply just leave with no consequences whatsoever other than that you cannot reapply for citizenship. That is all. And to then also look at this and think, oh, this is very clearly a highly militaristic society. Okay, I skipped the scene where he pointed out the disabled veterans previously, because it kind of rolls into this point. But the reason why there are disabled veterans at the recruitment desk, and why Ratshack as well is a disabled veteran, is in part to discourage people from joining up. It is to show them front and center these are the potential costs of federal service. In fact, in the movie and the book, Rico says that Ratchak is not using the classroom as a recruitment ground. In fact, he is discouraging them. And do you actually believe that a highly militaristic society would have completely voluntary military service that you could leave at any time? <laughs> Come now. Violence is integral to their culture. The Lava Lamp cast is fun and a quick way of showing us that serious injuries for us aren't a big deal in this world. And as a little bit of a side point, yes, this is also sort of pseudo kind of correct. Violence is not integral to their culture, it is integral to the military in which they are currently in. And yes, the drill sergeants are able to do extreme things to the recruits because they can fix it up. Breaking a recruit's arm is a fantastic way of informing him that you're not as tough as you think you are. And if they can do it without any long-term consequences, in fact it is literally fixed till lunch, well, that's a wonderful way of teaching a very valuable lesson that will stay with the recruit for a very long time. Put down on this, son. It helps. No. Good guy, Zim? I mean, at least in the context of a totalitarian punitive state. And the whipping scene. So, I like the way he puts it here. In a totalitarian punitive state. As if our modern day states aren't punitive. <laughs> 
In fact, I would argue that our modern day states are significantly more punitive than the Terran Federation. Okay, so murder carries the death penalty. Fair enough. But in this case, what is Rico guilty of? He is guilty of negligent homicide or involuntary manslaughter because he orders a man to take off his helmet during a live fire exercise which results in the recruit placed under Rico's command dying. In fact, this is probably worse than negligent homicide. Now, normally, that carries in our society a sentence from everything between one to six years in jail. And Rico gets away with 12 lashes. What is the more humane punishment here? 12 lashes, which teaches you a lesson you will never forget, and then no one ever talks about it ever again. It is done, your punishment is over, it is never mentioned to Rico at any point thereafter. Or six years in jail and probably a permanent mark on your record for manslaughter. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I'll take the lashes any day of the week. And this is the main reason Buenos Aires is destroyed, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. What? what? <laughs> Excuse me? I'm not entirely sure about the logic here. I'm presuming that what he's meaning is that because the Roger Young collided slightly with the asteroid, it moved the asteroid in such a way that it struck Buenos Aires instead of its intended target, which I believe has been stated to be Geneva, in which case, okay. But, I mean... The main reason, I feel like the main reason, was because he was fired at Earth by bug plasma to begin with, but quibbles, I suppose. Doesn't look like it to me. Good guy, Zim. I mean, at least in the context of a militarized Warhawk state. I feel like I need to rip off the counter joke here, because we've got quite a few scenes here where it goes like, well, this is clearly a militaristic, fascistic Warhawk state. As Sim is ripping apart official state documents with the permission of his superior officer, who turns around and goes, Yep, yeah, I don't care. See, again, this is why an actual understanding of what fascism is is so important, because fascism worships the state, it worships the system. That piece of paper is supposed to be worth more than Rico's life and his career, and yet everyone involved in this scene is completely disregarding of the paper, simply going, yep, that never existed, rip tear, rip tear, there you go. This is not fascism. And again, seeing this and still thinking fascism is a very clear indication that people really need to be taught what fascism was, unless we are actually going to start repeating it. And I goddamn ironically, <laughs> if fascism ever re-emerges, which it kind of has, as uh, Winston Churchill was erroneously quoted as saying, as anti-fascism, then a lot of people, cinema wins included, are not going to have the faintest clue what's happening. Frankly, I find the idea of a bug that thinks offensive. So the fascism doesn't really change debate shows. Okay, good to know. <sighs> just, just shoot me. Just, just put me out of my goddamn <laughs> Yes, fascism does in no way change public discourse or oppress differing opinions, in no way, and it would definitely go out of its way to make sure that publicly broadcasted debates on the war effort has opposing sides. Kill Arch. Kill Arch now! Goodness, thank god there's no such thing as a civilian bug. Extremely convenient. And on the topic of mild hopelessness, yeah, that's true. There are no civilian bugs. You know why? Because the fascist authoritarian absolute war machine dictatorship that you've been accusing the Terran Federation of being is the bugs. There is no part of bug civilization that is not aimed at and specialized towards furthering the goals of bug civilization. Oh, someone's definitely gonna play this clip out of context. War seems bad. Which leads me nicely on to the next point. Remember how I said that the modern mind all too often is incapable of conceptualizing a justifiable action? Well, this is it! No, war not bad. 
You can argue all you want that war is horrible on a personal level, yada yada, the brutality of it, so on and so on, but if it was not for war, you would be a fascist now. Waging war can be entirely justifiable and entirely necessary, as much and damn near as often as it can be the opposite. Defeating Nazi Germany was a good war. Fighting against Attila the Hun was a good war. The Romans subjugating the barbarians was a good thing. The Greeks defeating the Persians was a good thing. We can go back very, very far and find wars that made the world a better place. But in the modern day mind, where again, all we are thinking of is fuzzy shades of black and white, war bad. Even when you are fighting against the genocidal species of space insects that want nothing more than to wipe out humanity. And just in case you think I'm exaggerating, we actually move on to hammer this point home. She died for basically nothing. It was mostly a fluke during a mission that was to use live bait to spring a mousetrap. A sane person would be enraged. A fascist would say, well, he, he literally says it himself a few minutes later. It sent hundreds of people like you to their deaths. Didn't they tell you, Colonel? That's what the mobile infantry's good for. A citizen has the courage to make the safety of the human race their personal responsibility. And I mean, that's his arc. Ratchak asks if Rico believed in the beginning, and he fully does now. No human cost too great for victory and the destruction of the bugs. And Carl still sucks. He's acting like he's seen some stuff, but Dizzy literally died in Rico's arms. He's seen 90% of his original squad confettied in front of him, and even Carmen risked her own life to fly into the swarmed base. But yes, lecture these two. Real firing you is harder on me than it is on you, Energy. And it's not just the uniform. Carl starts out as a lighthearted goof. Over the course of the war, he's become a fascist, but it's not hammy or silly. You can see it on his face and in his eyes, hear it in his voice. Sending kids to their deaths takes a toll on humans, or at least it You don't approve. Well, too bad. We're in this for the species, boys and girls. It's simple numbers. They have more. And every day, I have to make decisions that send hundreds of people like you to their deaths. I played you several clips in a row there to illustrate the sheer density of wrong on display here, as again, the modern mind is incapable of conceptualizing of a justifiable action. We begin by going, okay, D Dizzy dies for nothing, uh -huh. is that true? No. And how do we know that isn't true? Well, he goes on to say that Rico has now been fully brainwashed, that no human cost is too great for victory and the destruction of the bugs. Yes, correct. And that is why Dizzy did not die for nothing. The bugs are genocidal colonialists. The bugs wish to wipe out humanity. If the bugs win, that means the death of every single last human, every man, every woman, every child. That is why, definitionally, no cost is too great for victory, because defeat means extermination. And if anyone would sit down for two seconds and rub a pair of neurons together, this would be blindingly self-evident, and yet again, in the hazy black and white fog of the modern mind, they simply do not combine into a complete thought. Even then going on, of course, to attack Carl, saying, Oh, who is Carl? He hasn't seen anything. Is he lecturing these two combat veterans? Carl is a bigger veteran than both of them. Carl is a part of intelligence. Carl has seen thousands, hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of people die. He has seen war front after war front lost. He has seen entire civilian population centers slaughtered to the last person. He knows that if they do not win, that is the end of humanity. Which is why, yes, when he sends the squad onto such a mission, that is necessary. Command requires absolute proof that the bugs are intelligent, because you do not wage war on an intelligent species in the same way you do an unintelligent species. This will change the entire strategic command and directive of the entire Terran Federation war effort, which is why they have to be sure. They must be sure because they cannot afford another Clendathu. 
This is not Carl moving from being the silly goofball kid into a Nazi. This is Carl moving from being the silly innocent teenager that cannot understand that the world is real, that hardship is real, that the enemy is real, and that there are actually enemies out there that wish to kill you and into someone who understands that, who realizes that you are not safe in Buenos Aires, you are not safe aboard your spaceship, you are not safe in your bed, if the bugs win, you and everyone you've ever known and cared for will die. And when you realize that, it becomes a lot easier to send people to their deaths because you know what the alternative is. And this is also why this next scene is so important. It's afraid. It's afraid! <laughs> you have to love it. Fear, the ultimate goal. Yes, fear is important. Because up until this point, Carl and Intelligence had pretty much assumed that they were boned. That they were completely screwed. But now they know that their enemy is afraid. Their enemy is worried that they can be beat which gives Carl hope. That's why he's happy for it. Not just because he's enjoying the fear, but because this is probably the first hope that the Terran Federation has had since Klandathu. An enormous shakeup of the Terran Federation, as interestingly enough, the um, Cinema Wins forgot or neglected to mention the fact, of course, that there is accountability in the Terran Federation. The Sky Marshal steps down, seemingly voluntarily, after the Klandathu disaster. One of the highest military leaders in the fascist empire takes responsibility publicly and cedes power voluntarily to someone else. Damn, fascism is weird, and honestly, I, it sounds like a much better system than we have. <laughs> so, so weird. It's almost like it's not fascism at all. And what it is, is a film about fascism. Director Paul Verhoeven and writer Edward Neumeyer have both said so multiple times. It's not up for debate. It was their intent, and they executed it with the precision of Ratchek putting a trooper out of his misery. But yet again, we arrive at the media literacy test. See, here's the thing. If somebody tells you that they have made a movie about a kitten living a happy life purring away in the forest as a form of ASMR, and then you open the video, and it's actually a video about a giant dude in a mask made of human skin tearing apart teenagers with a chainsaw. Do you th still think that it's a video about a goddamn kitten because the person who made it told you so? It's idiotic. Oh, well, the director says it's fascism. The director knows nothing more about fascism than you quite self-evidently do. And I'm sorry if I'm sounding a bit mean on this, because I don't necessarily want to, because this is understandable, right? No one knows what fascism is today, and that is, again, a genuine goddamn problem, because, once more, if fascism does arrive in, oh, I don't know, perhaps, let's say... And as someone who is against fascism, even anti that word, yeah, yeah, that. The, you know, actually violent, thuggish movement that has carried out straight-up street executions against political opponents. The political opinion of the Rhine that has claimed areas of sovereign nations for their own. That movement, that movement seems awfully fascistic, indeed. But again, if you have no idea what fascism is, it might just slip you by. Like a few other things might. And look, I don't want to get all Buenos Aires truther on you, but uh, how did the bugs actually throw that asteroid? And so accurate from across the galaxy? And if it was in response to the Mormon settlers, how did it get to Earth in less than a couple million years? They strap FTL drafts to those things? I'm not saying anything here, but someone might want to check the serial numbers on those bug asteroids. I'm just saying. Is this the flag of peace lovers, or is that false? you didn't hear it from me. Even if we take the asteroid attack at face value, a genocidal ground invasion still makes no sense, especially when the entire war effort is portrayed as defensive and the humans are in arachnid space. With the orbital defense grid, there should be no more fear of the bugs. They don't have spaceships. There's a reason the Federation is attacking, and it's not about protection, it's expansion. I'll stop there, but if you just connect a few dots, there are myriad reasons things happen the way they do, and by and large, it's not whatever Rico or possibly even Carl think. 
but I'd never blame Zim or Ratchek. That type of stuff is way above their pay grade. Maybe, Hank. Yeah, like, this is just... <laughs> I, I think this... Cope is actually... Yeah. No, cope is the word that comes to mind. No, the bugs do have spaceships. The bugs do have FTL technology. We know this for an absolute fact, because the bugs are invading other planets. Carl mentions it. The other troopers mention it. The war is not happening just on Klandathu. Obviously, the arachnids can move across the galaxy. And if we look deeper into the setting, we in fact realize that the bugs have transport ships that they can fire bug meteors from via bug plasma. And even then, it is difficult for the bugs to do this. It is something that requires tremendous effort and therefore is not something that happens very often. But obviously, the bugs can move. To go like, hmm, it must be the Federation who's being evil. Instead of assuming that the bugs have space fetting technology that we haven't seen is ridiculous. And no, a ground invasion of Klandathu is the only choice because you cannot simply trust in a defensive grid to keep you safe. I mean, God help you. <laughs> just, just imagine the situation. There is a thing that is trying to kill you, that is trying to kill millions of you. Would you be like, oh, well, we're just going to let that thing exist. We're going to, we're gonna just, just going to let it be there. Uh, we have, we've got this automated system that will probably intercept most of the stuff they throw at us. And again, at this point, the Terran Federation views the bugs as goddamn animals to be exterminated because they don't think they can negotiate with them, which they can't. And since they can't negotiate with them, the only way to stop them from shooting meteors at Earth is to destroy the source of the meteors, which is the enormous asteroid belt around Klandathu. Oh my god, I... Actually, let me just... Let's just wrap it up there with one final little moment of idiocy. I think it vastly succeeds as both, but feel free to disagree. After all, figuring things out for yourself is the only true freedom anyone has. Yeah, sorry, there's no way I'm ending on a quote from a fascist. Fascists suck and war sucks. As Howard Zinn said, war itself is the enemy of the human race. And if that isn't the perfect ending from the anti-fascist, I don't know what is. No, actually, you don't get to make up your own mind. You don't get to have that freedom. You will agree with my opinion on things. Otherwise, well, things might get violent. <laughs> I adore that. I love it. You, even admitting, like, oh yeah, this is pretty good advice. And then like, no, 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 this is clearly fascistic. Absurd, but admittedly not as absurd as then ending with war itself is the enemy of the human race in a movie where the human race is being exterminated by arachnids. Oh god, help me. See, for the umpteenth time, this is my point. The modern day mind seems fully incapable of understanding and rationalizing anything with which it has not already been pre-programmed. The sentence, war is bad, is a pre-programmed one that takes into consideration nothing surrounding that sentence. And thus you can say that war itself is the true evil even when humanity is being genocided by aliens. The Japanese have an interesting term that goes something like this, Hewa Byo, or peace sickness in English. It refers to the idea that if humanity is allowed to remain at peace, fluffy, fat, warm, and isolated for too long, it becomes a sickness, a disease of the mind. And God help me, but stuff like this makes me think the Japanese had a very good point. Until next time, I've been Arch. Thank you all very much for watching, and I do hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.